series, this time by Henri Darmont, who will talk about hidden points, dark hidden points, and explicit particle theory for real quadratic fields. Uh, thank you for, for the introduction, and thank you. This is the first le my, my first lecture in the series. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be visiting Moscow. So um, I want to begin with a theme that uh, Victor touched on in his lectures, which was a very important theme of modularity of elliptic curves and how that sheds light on the arithmetic of elliptic curves. So as he explained in his talk yesterday, so uh, if E is, so e, we're interested in understanding an elliptic curve E over the rationals. So if E over Q is an elliptic curve. Uh, well, we know thanks to the work of Wiles that this elliptic curve is modular, namely it corresponds to a modular form. There's, then there is a uh, modular form F of weight 2 on the Hecke congruence group gamma naught of n, which Victor introduced the last time in his lectures, where here n is a quantity that can be computed for it's the arithmetic conductor of E. So there's a modular form of this sort with the property that the Hecke L function of F is equal to the Hasseve L function of the elliptic curve. That's just a concise way of saying that the coefficients a, p of e, which are obtained by counting the number of points on the elliptic curve mod p, at least for the primes of good reduction of the elliptic curve, are correspond to the p Fourier coefficient of the modular form f, which is the more ana analytic function, if you want, of the prime p. OK, so we have this uh, relation between uh, I mean, these L functions are just generating series made from these coefficients, and their equality is a equivalent to the uh, identity between these coefficients. So um, we can ask what are the consequences of uh, modularity for the arithmetic elliptic curves. Of course, this is a fundamental result of Wiles. The fact that every elliptic curve is in this way over the rationals associated to a modular form. So some of the applications or consequences of this result, why it's so fundamental to our understanding of elliptic curves, well, the first one is that it allows us to actually give a list of elliptic curves ordered, say, by increasing conductor, which is certainly something that we would like to know if you're interested in elliptic curves. We would like to understand a bit of the landscape of how many elliptic curves there are, say. So we can make lists. And the reason for that is that um, well, as Victor explained also in his talk, modular forms of weight 2 on gamma naught of n are very geometric objects. They correspond to differentials. So forms of weight 2 correspond to differentials on the Riemann surface, if you want, uh, which is obtained by taking the quotient of the, of, of the upper half plane by the congruence group gamma naught of n. Well, I mean, this is a, an open curve with a complex number, open Riemann surface, and we can compactify it by suitably joining some cusps. And the uh, forms of weight 2, the cusp forms of weight 2 correspond exactly to regular differentials on this Riemann surface, on this curve. And therefore, we can understand that we can classify them. We can understand that thanks to Riemann rock, we know the dimension of the space of regular differentials is a genus of the curve, and so on. So we have a lot of very nice computational methods for actually enumerating all the modular forms of a given level, okay, level being this integer n. And uh, there are algorithms given a modular form to find the, so the associated elliptic curve. So these, uh, uh, this led to uh, tables that were drawn by Cremona, in fact, even before modularity was known, but which are now unconditional. And currently, uh, in these in this database of Cremona, we have uh, an exa uh, exhaustive list of all elliptic curves of conductor less than or equal to 300, uh, yeah, 350,000. This is quite remarkable. It's a, rem a remarkable amount of data. When Cremona first started doing his calculations in the early 90s, he made a list of elliptic curves of conductor less than 1,000. 
And I took up a, bo a book about this thick that was edited, published, and you could, you could buy. And so this data would take up uh, several shelves on a library if you were actually to print it in book form. Of course, it's available as data uh, free on the internet that anyone can download and use in research. So this is actually a very valuable resource in studying elliptic curves. The second application, which uh, Victor discussed in his lecture, and which is maybe closer to uh, the main theme of these lecture series, which is the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture, is, uh, so this is part uh, application two, I guess, is um, the fact that it gives us some information about the L function. So the fact that this mysterious Hasse-Weyl function of the elliptic curve, which is the main object mm -hmm. in the Bertrand Sernet and Dyer conjecture, the main thing that we're really interested in understanding, is, so it's, its behavior at s equals one is conjecturally related to the arithmetic of the curve, the rank of Mordell Weg, and so on and so forth. Well, this L function is identified with the Hecke L function attached to the modular form, as I wrote here. And this L function admits, and uh, we've known this for a long time through work of Hecke, it admits an, an, uh, uh, an integral representation in terms of the modular form F. We can, if we suitably complete this L function by adding um, uh, some, some uh, explicit factors, I think 2 pi uh, to the minus S, N to the minus 2S, gamma of S, LFS. So this um, a function, is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of f of i y y to the s ds over s. So it's essentially, when you multiply the L function by suitable gamma factors and simple expressions, uh, it becomes the Mellon transform of this modular form. And this expression allows us to derive the analytic continuation and functional equation for the L function. The invariance properties of f or of f of z dz under the modular group translate into a functional equation status. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, dy, dy over y, absolutely. Sorry, thanks. So it's the Mellon transform relative to uh, this, yeah, this variable s. So that translates into the functional equation for this, uh, this L function, this completed L function. And that's something that Victor also mentioned in his talks. Now, what I would like to talk about now are maybe other applications or other consequences for BSD of this fundamental property of modularity. Um, and in order to do that, I want to give a few more, a few other statements of modularity, sort of equivalent uh, formulations of this basic property of being modular. So I'm going to give uh, alternate statements. So um, the first one has a bit of a cohomological flavor. Cohomological. And it's going back to these Galois representations, which Victor discussed in his talk, and that uh, uh, are going to play a key role in, in uh, my discussion today. So the cohomological flavor, we saw that um, we can associate to the elliptic curve E certain Galois representations. And these are very um, simple objects. Uh, namely, we can take a prime P and consider the module of P of p division points on the elliptic curve. As uh, Victor explained in his talk, this is abstractly isomorphic. I mean, first, we consider the points of order p defined over q bar. And as a, an abelian group, this is abstractly isomorphic to two copies of z mod pz. So it's a, just a z mod pz squared, but it has more structure than that because it, these points arise as the solutions of an algebraic equation defined over the rationals. Uh, this module is equipped with a natural action of the Galois group, which is, preserves the group structure. So it's a linear action. And we can take the p to the n torsion as well. And then we get a module which is uh, isomorphic to two copies of z mod p to the n z squared, like equipped with a linear action of the Galois group. And we can even, if you want to be a bit more fancy, pass to the inverse limit relative to 
the integers n. And if we do that, we get something which is the inverse limit of the z mod p to the n z squared relative to the natural projection maps from z mod p to the n plus 1 to z mod p to the n. And this inverse limit is just two copies. Uh, it's just uh, zp squared. So this object uh, has a natural continuous Galois action as well. And this gives rise to a linear representation with characteristic zero coefficients, which is an advantage of it, of the Galois group on this, on this thing. This is called the Tate module of the elliptic curve. And it's commonly denoted Tp of e. And then we have a variant, if, if we want to make this into a, a Qp vector space, which is convenient for various constructions of linear algebra, we define Vp of e to be this inverse limit of, of uh, p to the n torsions and uh, tensor it simply uh, with Qp to turn it into a Qp vector space. So this is just a very simple object in a way. It's a, just a two-dimensional vector space over the field of piadic numbers. But it's endowed also with a continuous action of the Galois group, which gives, of course, all its structure and richness. Mm -hmm. So this Vp of e you should think of as being kind of like the DNA of the elliptic curve. It carries a lot of arithmetic information about the elliptic curve. As I think Victor mentioned uh, on Monday, uh, the traces of the Frobenius elements at primes different from p encode the number of points on the elliptic curve over the various finite fields and, and so on. OK, so that's the, the and, and these Galois representations have a cohomological interpretation. Namely, we can identify a Vp of e with the etal cohomology. This is just a concrete description of the etal cohomology of the elliptic curve E over Q bar with coefficients in QP twisted once. Okay, so this twisting is not very important. Uh, it's a bit of a notational nuisance, but it kind of records the fact that uh, the Galois action is modified uh, by uh, a power of the cyclotomic character. It's not very important. I'll, I'll, I'll say more about it a bit later when I get into the details. OK, so this is the uh, cohomology of the, of the curve. And we can now also consider, um, yeah, so we have, on the other hand, uh, the mo these modular curves, which Victor described last time as Riemann surfaces, essentially. So when we look at the quotients of uh, H, the upper half plane, by the congruent subgroup gamma naught of n, this can be identified with the complex points of a Riemann surface. So this Riemann surface, I mean, uh, a Riemann surface, this Riemann surface can be viewed as the complex points of an algebraic curve which has a model over the rational. So this algebraic curve is commonly called y0 of n. It's a so-called open modular curve. And so y0 of n is a curve over the rationals. OK, so um, how does that go? Um, let me see. Uh, uh, yes. OK, so um, we can think of modular curves complex analytically as, a, as quotients of the upper half plane by the action of some discrete subgroup of SL2z. But uh, what gives rise to this algebraic structure that they correspond to curves over Q is the simple fact that the quotient h mod SL2z to begin with, so h modulo the principal subgroup SL2z acting on h by Mobius transformations, this can be identified with the set of isomorphism classes of elliptic curves A over C. This is a connection between modular curves and elliptic curves, which is far less deep than the connection that arises here from Weyl's theorem, that an elliptic curve over the rationals corresponds to a special kind of regular differential on the modular curve. Here we're saying that individual points on the modular curve are indexed in a natural way with isomorphism classes. And this correspondence is very simple. If I give myself a tau, a point tau on the upper half plane, I can associate to it the quotient of the complex numbers 
by the lattice generated by one and tau. And this quotient is just a torus, it's a complex torus. This lattice is just a set of all the z linear combinations of one and tau. Weierstrass theory tells me that this is an elliptic curve over the complex numbers. So I can write this as a, in terms of an equation, y squared equals x cubed plus uh, a of tau x plus b of tau. And um, these complex numbers are kind of invariants of the uh, isomorphism class of the elliptic curve. In fact, there's really one invariant, one numerical invariant one can compute from an equation of elliptic curve, which is invariant under all possible changes of coordinates, which is invariant under, under uh, which is an isomorphism invariant. And that's the so-called J invariant. So if I have an elliptic curve like that, then this, the J of this elliptic curve is just uh, given by a formula. If I'm not mistaken, it's uh, A cubed over uh, 4 A cubed minus 27 B squared, something like that. Maybe there's a 1728 here. Yeah. But it's some simple polynomial expression in these coefficients A and B. And if you change the equation by modifying, making a change of variables, and bringing it to some equivalent wise transform, the J does not change. OK, so that's uh, one uh, correspondence. Now, conversely, if you're given an elliptic curve E over C, then you can go backwards, up to isomorphism, you can go backwards by choosing a differential omega in omega 1 of E. Since E is an elliptic curve, the space of regular differentials on it is one dimensional. You can just choose a, a basis, a generator for this vector space of differentials. And you can also choose a basis, gamma 1, gamma 2, for the homology. So basis for the homology of E of C with coefficients in Z. And now to this data, you associate the ratio, uh, the integral over gamma 1 of omega divided by the integral of, over gamma 2 of omega. This is a complex number. It does not depend at all on the choice of omega. Because if I had scaled omega, I wouldn't affect the period ratio. It does depend on the choice of a basis for the homology, but two bases differ by a transition matrix in SL2Z. I, I should say that there's a condition on being, I, I, I want the choice to be such that the ratio belongs to the upper half plane and not the lower half plane. And that kind of pins down an orientation on the basis. And then if I change my basis by a matrix in SL2Z, well, that affects the corresponding complex number by a Mobius transformation. So these two maps are mutually inverse to each other, and they give a bijection between these two sets. But once we understand that, then we can, we can consider what's called essentially the moduli space of uh, elliptic curves over, ra over the rationals, the, the set which classifies uh, these the, the parameter space it's not quite a moduli space but that's a small technical issue which I, I won't be uh, very concerned with so uh, essentially this, so this is the curve y0 of n y0 of 1 sorry so y0 of 1 the set of points on this curve over a field k is simply the set of, of J invariants, which belong to K. And of course, between the J invariants and K and the elliptic curves of over K, there is essentially a bijection. The only point that's a little bit subtle, and it has to do with the fact that this is not quite a moduli space, is that it's, it's, it's a kind of a coarse invariant in that two elliptic curves over K with the same J invariant are isomorphic but not necessarily over k, only over the algebraic closure. Mm -hmm. So this classifies elliptic curves over k. So these J invariants classify elliptic curves over k, but taken up to k bar isomorphism, not k isomorphism. But other than that, this is a okay. So we have this, this, this curve, and then we can consider y0 of n. Uh, the quotient by uh, a smaller group. And a similar construction, well, we can associate to such a point on this quotient, um, h mod gamma 0 of n, so h modulo gamma 0 of n, 
we can uh, consider maybe something like isomorphism classes of pairs consisting of an elliptic curve over C together with a subgroup C of order n. So C is contained in E, and C is isomorphic to Z mod n z. And now, given a tau in the upper half plane, or a gamma naught of n orbits of such taus, we can associate the elliptic curve C modulo the lattice generated by 1 and tau together with the subgroup generated by 1 over n. So that's a nice cyclic subgroup of the quotient of order n. And uh, well, I leave it as an exercise to figure out how you go back in the other direction. So um, this tells us that we can similarly define, uh, uh, write down y0 of n as the solution of some kind of moduli problem or coarse moduli problem classifying elliptic curves with a little bit of extra structure, namely the cyclic subgroup of order n on it. And so then, a k-rational point on y0 of n is going to correspond simply, simply to the set of all pairs consisting of an elliptic curve over k together with a subgroup of order n also defined over k taken up to isomorphism over eventually the algebraic closure. So these are these modular curves, and so, that, so that now we can think of them as being uh, given by equations with rational coefficients. And in particular, when we consider the cohomology of these curves, base change to the algebraic closure, the cohomology remembers mm -hmm. that the curve came from uh, something over, over defined over Q. And uh, that translates into the fact that the et al cohomology is not just a naked vector space, but it's endowed with a nice Galois action like the cohomology of the elliptic curve that I started with. So we, have, we can consider the etal cohomology of the curve y0 of n with coefficients in uh, qp and uh, try to analyze that. And so the cohomology, uh, the, uh, so the, the um, cohomological uh, version of modularity is simply the statement that um, for any elliptic curve over the rationals of conductor n, its cohomology arises as a constituent of the etal cohomology of some modular curve. Okay, so I'll write that down. So, um, so modularity in a cohomological form. Uh, yeah, so there is, there, there exists. So given an elliptic curve E over the rationals of conductor N, there exists a Galois equivariant map. So this G sub Q is always the symbol I'll use, the notation I'll use for the absolute Galois group of Q bar over Q, the automorphisms of the algebraic closure. So there exists a GQ equivariant projection from the etal cohomology of uh, the elliptic or the, the modular curve x naught of n viewed over q bar with coefficients in qp to gh1 etal of the elliptic curve over q bar with coefficients in QP. So this cohomology appears in the cohomology of a suitable modular curve. Now before, and also Victor in his lectures explained a little bit how you can think concretely about the first etal cohomology of an elliptic curve in terms of the module of torsion points is a very simple thing. There's a corresponding fairly concrete description of the first etal cohomology of a, of a general curve. And this has to do this is, uh, arises by considering the so-called Jacobian variety of the, of the underlying curve. Okay, so the etal cohomology of, um, yeah, here I wrote x naught of n. I could have written y naught of n as well. So y naught of n is my notation with the open curve, but then we can also compactify it by adding some costs to get this complete curve, x naught of n. 
So uh, the co it tells cohomology of the complete curve x naught of n q bar with coefficients in qp is also identified with um, the uh, Tate module, the so-called Jacobian. So J I'll denote by J0 of n the Jacobian variety, Jacobian variety of this curve, x0 of n. And then if I put a twist by one here, I can identify this with the projective limit of the p to the n torsion of this Jacobian, limit as n, inverse limit with n. And then this is sort of g copies of zp, sorry, two g copies of zp where g is the genus of the curve, which is the dimension of the Jacobian. And I turn this into a QP vector space by tensing with Q. Okay. So this is uh, the cohomological statement of modularity that, yeah. Uh, so apparently, the equivalence is, well, the equivalence on X uh, take tangential proved by Falcon. But actually, what can we work out this? Is true? You're, you're actually anticipating what I'm going to say shortly. Actually, this here. This is exactly the form of modularity that was proved by Wiles, this form, because it relies only on Galois representations. Okay, so what Wiles the does, equation. the functional equation of the modularity, well, what Wiles really proved is the cohomological version of modularity. It's this version. All right, because the basic approach, the basic strategy of Wiles is to consider all the Galois representations whose mod p reduction is a given one and show by essentially a kind of counting argument that all on the, on the one hand one has the modular represent the Galois representations come from modular forms and one can count them and he has sort of can show that there are as many arising from elliptic curves or you know, general objects that, as those that come from modular forms so this is exactly the form that was proved by Wiles. that's actually a good point to make so this form is really what Wiles proof. But then there is an ostensibly stronger, and in fact in many cases we'll see it's a genuinely stronger ver variant of modularity, of the statement of modularity, which I will call maybe modularity in the geometric form. And this is the statement that not only does the etal cohomology of the elliptic curve, the Galois representation attached to the figure, arise as the quotient of the Galois representation attached to a modular curve, but in fact the elliptic curve itself is geometrically a quotient of uh, the modular curve or its Jacobian. So the geometric form of modularity is that there exists a morphism, uh, surjective of course, a surjective morphism of algebraic varieties over Q from the Jacobian, J0 of N, to E. And, uh, well, I mean, if you remember that the universal property of the Jacobian, that the curve embeds in its Jacobian after choosing a base point on E, on the curve, like uh, the point at the cusp at infinity, then this gives rise to a map from the modular curve to the elliptic curve the so-called modular parameterization. Okay. Now, the geometric form clearly implies the uh, cohomological form. Okay, so geometric form of modularity implies the cohomological. What, why is that? Anyone say why, why, what it is that tells you that geometric modularity, so saying that there's a map like this from the Jacobian of J naught to E, why would that imply that there's a map on these cohomologies? Well, I mean, so this is a formal, actually, a kind of a formal deduction from the basic properties of cohomology. So what's the basic property of cohomology that we use to make this deduction? It's, well, it's the... Mm. 
It's simply the functoriality. The functoriality of cohomology, that if you have a map on the varieties, well, that will induce a map on the cohomologies. Uh, just, uh, yeah, so. Uh, right, uh, that, that, that's true, that's true. You're, you're right, <laughs> sorry. It's true that the map goes in the other direction, but then there is a duality that allows you to, uh, uh, he, here in modularity, there are maps actually in both directions. So you can think of E as a quotient of J0 of N or as a sub-variety of J0 of N. Um, yeah, so maybe <laughs> write this to be completely. And you can go from one to the other by, well, I mean, these are principally polarized varieties, so we can pass over the duals. We get maps in both directions. Um, so, so this in, in, implication just follows from the functoriality, the, func the functorial properties of taking the associated Galois representations, so of cohomology. Any cohomology theory that you write down, if it's worth anything, is going to have to, of course, respect uh, morphisms between varieties. Um, the other direction is much less, um, this is uh, not formal at all, and this is much deeper. So the fact that the cohomological form of modularity implies a geometric modularity, this is what, uh, what you mentioned just before, this follows from the Tate conjecture proved by faulting. So follows from the Tate conjecture proved by faulting. So the Tate conjecture for curves over the rationals or over a number of fields, uh, and the Tate conjecture for abelian varieties. So what the Tate conjecture asserts is that any map, any Galois equivariant map between cohomologies of of uh, curves has to be explained by the fact that it arises from a morphism of the underlying geometric objects. Okay, so um, there's a natural map coming from the functoriality from the homomorphisms of algebraic curves from J naught of N to E to um, the Galois equivariant homomorphisms on the cohomologies h1 of j0 of n, q bar h1 of e, it's out cohomologies. Um, and these, so these are more just uh, Galois equivariant morphisms of QP vector spaces. So it's a QP vector space. If you tensor with QP, then the Tate conjecture asserts that this map is a surjection. So what uh, the geometry, the, the cohomological form of modularity asserts that there's an element in here, an isomorphic, I mean, a, homo, a surjective map from here to there. And that has to come from some homomorphism on the underlying curves, maybe with QP coefficients, but anyway, that morphism exists. Okay, so that's the... One overcome. It depends what you mean by overcome. I mean, I mean, suppose we didn't have yeah, no, I think we would be in trouble. There were, there were, um, Ver there were special cases of this that were proved before faulting. So, for example, Serre had proved this fact for elliptic curves with non-integral J invariant using the the, uh, the Tate parameterization of the elliptic curve. So, just using the local Galois action, he was able to. But those are very special cases. I mean, so for general elliptic curves, I think one really needs uh, this close to the full strength of, of faulting's result. So, so for, for, for the function of the x of the plan, we do have a Absolutely. So the problem is that if you do have it for representation, don't have it for direct sum. This is the problem. Right? For so, I mean, I mean, modularity is also equivalent, equivalent, equivalent to just of having functional equation for L function, right? Exactly. Yes. And this so cohomological so version implies the the statement, yes, that the L function of E is equal to the L function of the modular form. No, wait, wait, so, 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 so this cohomological version yes. implies. The fact that L L E S, the Hasse L function, mm -hmm. is equal to L F S. So the L using, function of the using Tate conjecture. No. That is independent of Tate conjecture. Because all that you need uh, for this, this, uh, this, this equality is telling us that A A P of E is equal to A P of, of F. And so it's telling us I mean these Frobenius traces. These are the, tra I mean, this AP of E I can interpret as the trace of Frobenius at P, or maybe AL, I should say, rather than AP. 
This AL is interpreted as the trace of the Frobenius at L on the cohomology of E. Because the cohomology of E appears in the cohomology of the modular curve, and because of the Aisha Shimura relation, and so I can interpret the L for a coefficient of the modular form likewise as a trace of Frobenius on that piece of the cohomology of the modular curve. These traces agree for all Frobenius elements, therefore the Galois representations are isomorphic. And conversely, the Galois representations are the traces agree, and so the L functions agree. So, so again, I can get so, uh, out. So, uh, so, so out of so this, you look at how do you get out of this uh, modular form without. So this form, this form is clearly equivalent to geometric form. This is not hard. This is without any convection, right? The initial form of the this? this one is equivalent to geometric form without. No. Well, there's an implication in one direction. Geometric implies this. The other implication is not clear at all. Maybe we can discuss it later. But I mean, uh, it's an important distinction, really, that you see, if you know this strong geometric form, then indeed you have a map like this. You take the neural differential on E, pull it back to J, you, you get a modular form, and wonderful. But what Wiles proves is not this. He doesn't construct this map. He only shows that the H1 of the elliptic curve appears in the H1 of the modular curve. Maybe we can say that. And, okay, and then, and then okay, we'll, we'll discuss it more later. Sure. Okay, so, um, yes. Uh, okay, so I, I, I did want to emphasize, because we're going to talk later about different variants of, or maybe gener potential generalizations of modularity that are relevant for the BSD conjecture. And the distinction between these two forms of the statement of modularity becomes very important because one is typically much harder to establish than the other. We'll see that already in the context of points on elliptic curves. Because now, what, do, what does this have to do with um, the bertrand Dyer conjecture? Ah. Okay, so um, yeah. So what is the connection with the Bertrand Dyer conjecture? Well, if you want to understand the BSD conjecture, you don't just want to understand what are all the elliptic curves that arise in nature, but you also want to understand their Mordell Vey groups, the groups of rational points on them. So you need to understand somehow. You need to understand not just E or the set of all E's, which is what modularity tells you about. But you need to understand, given a specific elliptic curve E, you need to understand a set of rational points. For example, you would like to understand the mechanism whereby the presence of many rational points on E of a large rank forces order of vanishing, forces vanishing of the L function at the central point. Those are things that you'd like to understand. So you'd like to understand these mordell Vey groups. And so one possible approach is to try to connect also uh, points on elliptic curves with objects related to modular forms and modular curves. Um, okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, so given a point Q in the mordell Vey group, E of Q, we can, as Victor explained last time in, in, in his lecture of yesterday, we can consider the open variety where we take E and you remove from E the point Q and for good measure, you also remove the origin. And you could try then to classify maybe the, the points that could arise in E by trying to understand the possible complements, the possible curve complements like this. And in keeping with our uh, discussion and also in, in Victor's discussion of the basic uh, strategy behind descent, to, under to try to classify all the possible curves like this that can arise that are defined over Q, you try to analyze the possible etal cohomology groups that can arise for such open elliptic curves with coefficients in QP. Mm -hmm. So this object is a very kind of uh, fundamental object in the study of the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture. It's what arises in descent. Um, it's, it's a Galois representation of dimension 3. It's a three-dimensional Galois representation. So it's a QP vector space of dimension 3. And like the Tate module of an elliptic curve, it has a very concrete, simple description, which I'll uh, try to uh, say something about now. OK. Um, 
So yes. So, uh, so out of the general, um, uh, I mean, the, the general formalism, if you want, of cohomology, any cohomology, not just et al, tells you that if you take this uh, cohomology, this open curve, there is a natural map to um, uh, some QP. So this is essentially a kind of residue map, if you think on, in terms of, uh, say, the Ram cohomology of differential forms. This would be a, just a residue map. It's a map from uh, to QP. And if you really have to want to keep track carefully of the Galois action, it's actually a QP of minus 1, in which the absolute Galois group of Q acts as the inverse of the cyclotomic character. And the cohomology of the open curve contains, in a natural way, the cohomology of the complete curve. Okay, this arising from the, co the contravariant functoriality of cohomology, since this curve is contained in that one. So we have this three-term exact sequence, and we know from our previous discussion this is a two-dimensional vector space over QP. This is a one-dimensional one. And this is a non, or possibly non-trivial extension of Galois representation. So this QP of minus 1 by this two-dimensional Galois representation. And so we want to understand this and thereby get at some kind of handle on the set of rational points. OK, so the problem then is to classify the possible extensions of piadic representations of the Galois group of Q that could arise in this way from points on elliptic curves. OK, so this map is something that uh, the assignment sending a point Q to this element to this, maybe I'll call it, I'll give a name to this exact sequence, I'll call it star. So this exact sequence I can think of as an element of the group of extensions, x1 of qp of minus 1 by the h1 of e q bar with coefficients in qp. Extension in the category of continuous representations of the Gawa group of Q. And so this map is called uh, delta. It's called the, it's the connecting homomorphism of Kummer theory, which also was introduced yesterday. And so this is a good, um, this is a nice uh, way of introducing the Kummer map from the point of view of motivating it, of un understanding why it's a natural thing to consider and why um, it's a natural object. Uh, but it's a little bit abstract. And so he now I want to make it a little bit more concrete and give you explicit uh, description of Yes. So, OK, so I'll, I'll explain that now. I'll try to make it a little bit more concrete, and then we'll see uh, there's a sort of general formalism. We'll relate this X group in the category of Galois representations to um, some Galois cohomology, and then we'll see that this, this follows. OK, so let's try to uh, understand this then a little bit more concretely. So of course, the key is to understand what, 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 what does this look like? in a concrete way. So if I take the h1 et al of the open elliptic curve, elliptic curve minus the two points, with coefficients in, say, z mod p to the n, z first. Since the cohomology with coefficients in zp is obtained just as an inverse limit, we first try to understand this. And as a Galois representation, one can show that this is identified with the set of all points uh, x in e of q bar such that p to the n, that's the p to the n here, of x times x belongs to the subgroup generated by uh, this 
point Q. So we look at all these points. So before, when we defined the Galois representation dash to E, we looked at all, instead of all points whose I image under the P to the N multiplication map is the origin. Now we look at the larger set of points, such that when you multiply by P to the N, you land in the group generated by Q. But you mod out by the trivial solution to this problem, namely the set of all multiples of the point Q itself. So you mod out by Z times Q. Okay? And it's not hard to see that this uh, is a rank 3 module, free module of rank 3 over Z mod P to the NZ. This is isomorphic to three copies of Z mod P to the NZ. It contains naturally as a submodule the set of all p to the n torsions, since being zero is uh, a particular case of being a multiple of q, and it contains the larger set of. Yeah. There, there any questions? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, okay, fine. So this, so this is the what it looks like, and now if you analyze how you, you can choose a basis for this uh, module of rank 3. Well, you could take as a basis E1, E2 for the P to the N torsion on E. And then as your third basis vector, you choose any point in E of Q bar with the property that uh, p to the n times e3 is equal to this point q, relative to the elliptic curve group law. And now, if you analyze the action of an element sigma in the Galois group, how does it act on these? Well, it preserves this submodule. So sigma of the first basis vector might be something like a e1 plus c e2, and sigma of e2 is going to be something like uh, B E1 plus D E2. And E3, well, so E3 is a point such that when you multiply by P to the N, you get Q. If you act on this by Galois, you will get another point, another solution to this equation. And any two solutions to that equation differ by some P to the N torsion point. So sigma E3 is going to be sent to E3 plus some. Um, some point of order of p to the n, so some linear combination of uh, e1 and e2, say alpha e1 plus beta e2. So the Galois representation, which I wrote down here, has, of course, this nice upper triangular form. No coefficient at e3. No coefficient at e3. Right, because uh, sigma of E3 minus E3. So E3 is, sigma E3 is another solution to this equation, because Q is defined over Q. And so any two solutions to this equation differ by, yeah, so that's it. So here I have a one. So the Galois representation really looks like this. It looks, it has this, um, ah yes, okay fine. So. Yes, it looks like this. You have uh, A, B, C, D relative to this basis, of course. And then you have one here. And the interesting thing is this alpha, beta. So sigma goes through some matrix like that. Okay, and this, what happens in this upper entry, this is naturally kind of, a, this column can be viewed as an element canonically of E, P to the N. And so it gives rise to uh, what's called the Galois co-cycle. So the function which associates to sigma this element of EP to the N is uh, so the class of this H1 of E minus zero Q. Okay, so I'm going to drop uh, coefficients uh, etal and so when I write down the cohomology I will always mean etal cohomology with coefficients in, in well no, let me actually write here C mod P to the N. Um, is determined by um, the function C 
from the Galois group of Q to E P to the N, which to an element sigma, to the element sigma which I wrote there, associates this alpha E1 plus beta E2. In other words, this is just sigma of the third basis vector minus this basis vector. Okay, and if you analyze the properties of this, this, this function on GQ, you see that it's not a homomorphism, but it has a co-cycle property. So C is an element of H1 of Q with values in the tape mode, in, in, in values in E P to the N. And now, by passing to the limit this construction, you get um, uh, a so taking the inverse limit with the integer n, you get an maybe a class C infinity or so that lives in H1 of the Gawa group. It's a Gawa cohomology of this uh, group with values in uh, Tp of E or Vp of E if you want to tensor with Qp. Okay, so this is the, uh, maybe a more, a slightly more concrete description of the connecting homomorphism of Kummer theory. And the standard way in which it's described in, in most texts when uh, the descent method is discussed, the descent method for elliptic curves, which which Victor touched on in his lecture of yesterday also, is to start with the multiplication by p to the n map on the set of points on the elliptic curve with coefficients in q bar. Now over the algebraic closure of q, the multiplication by p to the n map is always surjective. And it has a kernel, which is this module e p to the n. OK, so we have this short exact sequence of modules equipped with a continuous Galois action. The, G, the exact sequence of GQ modules. So we can take the cohomology of this short exact sequence for the action of the Galois group of Q. And now, when we take invariance under the Galois group, we get the, the multiplication by P to the N map on rational points over Q, which is not surjective anymore. That's the, right? I mean, not every point over Q can be divided by P to the N. So we, so taking uh, the cohomology with of GQ, we get E of Q mapping under P to the N to E of Q to E of Q. And this is not surjective. The failure of surjectivity is measured by the, um, the first cohomology of Q with values in this Galois module. So H1 of Q with values in E P to the N. So, if you now, uh, well, I mean, you, what this tells you is that the, cur so this map delta, therefore, when you look at, or maybe I'll call it delta n, the map to the p to the n, the mod p to the n, uh, is not injective on rational points. But we understand exactly what its kernel is. The kernel is exactly the image, the points that are divisible by p to the n. So if we now pass to the limit with n, we get a map which is injective on all the rational points, because no point in O of q can be infinitely divisible by p. OK, so, so, so this is the delta n. So delta n gives an injection from e of q mod p to the n e of q into the h1 of q e p to the n. And then, therefore, the, the delta infinity, if you want, gives an injection of e of q. So, so delta infinity is an injection from E of Q to this H1 of Q with values in Tp of E or Vp of E, doesn't matter. So this cohomology is a natural receptacle for the group of rational points. But whereas this object is quite hard to study, this is a theme that's going to recur in the coming lectures, we have a lot more uh, techniques to handle what happens in the world of Galois representations. This mirrors, again, a theme 
that came up in Weil's proof of the modularity. So I'm going to now uh, try to discuss this a little bit, uh, what we can say about um, the points that might arise and their possible connections to modular objects. Um, are there any questions, actually, before I continue about what I've said so far? So, this is, so here what I just did is to give some kind of, I mean, some of you might already be familiar with the connecting map of, homo of Kummer theory presented in this way, which is kind of the standard presentation. And then I gave this alternate way of viewing it, which is a little bit more abstract, but also a little bit more conceptual, and has virtue for me that it will motivate the definitions I'm about to make, relating points on elliptic curves with modular curves. Okay. Okay, so... Um, oh, okay, I guess this is a good point to make a break. Yeah, do you want to make a five minute break? Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so we can stop now and I'll resume later. I'll talk about modularity of points. With this discussion of the previous hour, I'm ready to uh, make a definition which is going to kind of motivate uh, various of the constructions which we'll be seeing throughout this uh, mini course in the coming uh, lectures. And this is a definition that of what it means for a point on an elliptic curve or a point in the Mordell Vey group of an elliptic curve to be modular. So we say that a point Q in the Mordell Bay group of E is modular. Um, yeah, it's modular, okay. I mean, well, we're this, I, have to, I want to emphasize that this is going to be kind of a provisional definition. We're going to later want to take this definition and maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, extend it a little bit uh, or relax it somehow. So. For now, we say that a point is modular if this non-semi-simple representation obtained by looking at the et al cohomology of the complement of zero Q with coefficients in QP occurs, it arises, in the cohomology of an open modular curve. So to make this definition precise, I have to tell you what I mean by open modular curve. So first thing, note that how this definition is analogous to the definition of modularity, at least in the cohomological form, which I stated before. So we say that an elliptic curve is modular if its et al cohomology arises as a quotient of the cohomology of a modular curve. We say that a point on the elliptic curve is modular if the cohomology of the point complement, which is this non-trivial extension of Galois representations, arises in the cohomology of a, an open modular curve. So an open modular curve is essentially going to be an open subvariety of, a, of, the, of the curve. Well, subvarieties of curves are very simple things. They're just complements of a finite collection of points. There's just the risky open subsets of the curve. But we can't, we're not allowed to take arbitrary points. We want to look at sub-varieties that arise that have some kind of modular origin. So, and what that means for us is that they should arise as the solution to some natural moduli problem. So in order to understand the open modular curves, I need to understand the, what are called the Shimura sub-varieties of a modular curve. So um, what are the, or, or equivalently I'll call them simply the modular sub-varieties sub-varieties of the modular curve x naught of n. 
OK, well, a subvariety of a curve is just a zero dimensional variety. So these are zero dimensional objects. And they have to arise as the solution to a moduli problem. So x naught of n is the moduli space, the classifying space of, um, so class classifies pairs consisting of an elliptic curve and the subgroup C, which is cyclic of order n, right? That's what we said before. So what kind of extra structure could you impose on such pairs so that we, you get some smaller uh, moduli problem, some more, uh, more uh, stringent condition? Well, one standard way of uh, adding extra structures to the objects that, are, that arise as solutions to moduli problems is to impose extra endomorphisms. So if we look at endomorphisms of E, so endomorphisms, of elliptic curves, well, in characteristic zero, the possibilities for such endomorphism rings are quite restricted. So we know that um, if E is a curve, is an elliptic curve over C or over any field of characteristic zero, any characteristic zero field, then we either have that the endomorphism ring of E is isomorphic to Z, or that the endomorphism ring of E is isomorphic to an order, an order in a quadratic imaginary field. So those are the two possibilities for the endomorphism ring. This is the sort of generic situation. If you take a generic elliptic curve, it has no endomorphisms beyond the multiplication by n maps, where n is an integer. And then for some exceptional elliptic curves, there are these extra endomorphisms. Now, this fact is easy to see. It's what's at the heart, or it's what forms the basis of the theory of complex multiplication. Well, I mean. Over for the complex numbers, it simply follows from the fact that if E is identified with C modulo a lattice, let's say lambda, lambda being a lattice, so if I have this uh, complex elliptic curve, then the endomorphism rings of, of E can be identified with a set of complex numbers, alpha, with the property that alpha sends lambda into lambda. For a generic rank 2 lattice in, in C, then this, uh, there are no such alphas. And occasionally, if, al if lambda happens to be commensurable with an order or an ideal for an order in an imaginary graph field, you will get a larger endomorphism ring. These special elliptic curves are called elliptic curves with complex multiplication. So if n of e is isomorphic to such an order o, o being contained in, in the maximal order. So quadratic imaginary fields are completely determined or classified by their discriminants. And the maximal order can always be written as z of d plus root minus d over 2, where minus d is a discriminant of the quadratic imaginary field. And um, uh, an order, in general, is just something of a ring of the form z of c times this generator, d plus root minus d over 2. And this integer c is called often the conductor of the order. So here the conductor of O is equal to c, and the discriminant of the order O, uh, if it's of this form, is just c squared times d. These are just notations. So these rings that arise as possibilities for the endomorphism ring of an elliptic curve are very easy to classify. They're completely determined up to isomorphism by their discriminants, and they're in bijection with the possible discriminants, of, 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 which are fundamental discriminants times squares of this form. So we have a very nice picture of these uh, things. And so my zero-dimensional subvarieties of the modular curve are simply going to be defined to be the moduli spaces consisting that classify pairs like this whose endomorphism ring is one of these O's. So given an order, 
I'm going to define sigma sub O. So given an order O in the field K, imagine a gravity field K, I define sigma O to be the classifying space, the coarse moduli space, for triples uh, consisting of my elliptic curve E, my subgroup C, and the J, which identifies O with the endomorphism ring of E comma C. Now, what do I mean by the endomorphism of a, an elliptic curve with a subgroup? I just mean an endomorphism of the underlying elliptic curve, which preserves the marked subgroup. That's all I mean. OK. And so what are some basic facts about these uh, sub-varieties? Well, as I said before, they're zero-dimensional. And we can compute their cardinality. So over the complex numbers, they're just a finite set of points. So uh, over C, sigma O of C is just uh, equal to a finite set. And we even have a formula for its cardinality, of cardinality. And the cardinality is uh, given by a very simple formula. It's the cardinality instead of homomorphisms from O into Z mod NZ times the class number H of O. The interesting part of this cardinality is really the second factor. So H of O is the cardinality of the Picard group of this order, so it's just the class number, in other words, of this quadratic imaginary order. This factor here corresponds to local obstructions to defining possible pairs of an elliptic curve in a subgroup of order n, whose endomorphism ring is exactly this O. If I have an injection or have an, uh, an isomorphism between O and the endomorphism ring, then this J, this O, preserves the subgroup C. So it acts as endomorphisms of C. But the endomorphism ring of C is just Z mod NZ. So I get in this way a homomorphism from O to Z mod NZ. So clearly, if this is non empty, it's going to have to, um, there's going to have to be such a homomorphism. And then uh, when you try to classify the possible points in, in this variety over C, you have to count the number of elliptic curves whose endomorphism ring is O. This is given by this factor here, the class number of O. This is just a theory of complex multiplication that counting the number of elliptic curves is given an isomor uh, endomorphism ring up to isomorphism. And then the second factor is the number of possible subgroups of order N on each elliptic curve, which are preserved by the endomorphism ring action. Okay, so that's the, the, the uh, appear, the, this is how this uh, variety looks over C. But we could also look at it over uh, Q. The zero dimensional variety over the rationals. So in other words, we want to know where the individual points in sigma O are defined. And the theory of complex multiplication tells us that these points are defined over a specific abelian extension of the quadratic imaginary field. So the theory of complex multiplication tells us that sigma O of Q is isomorphic to, well, this many copies of spec of H, HO. So HO um, where You're right, you're right, sorry. I mean, I, I really meant the scheme over Q. Yeah. So where HO 
is the uh, ring class field of K, K being the quadratic imaginary field of conductor C. So this is an abelian extension of K, which is distinguished by the fact that its Galois group over K is canonically identified with the Picard group of this order. So this is the Galois group of H O over K. So we have a clear picture of how the Galois group, if you want, of H O over K acts on the points of this scheme. It simply permutes them in a simply transitive way. So it's a ni very nice, uh, simple kind of sub -variety. And in some sense, from the modular point of view, these sigma O's are the only interesting natural sub-varieties of a modular curve that arise from its moduli interpretation. We can't just take arbitrary finite collections of points. We only look at those. And so uh, that gives, that, that gives a, makes completely precise my notion of modularity. I say that a point on an elliptic curve is modular if this non-semi-simple representation that I got from the open cohomology of the open curve arises in the cohomology of a complement of one of these sigma O's. And then another question we want to understand is since we know that all elliptic curves are modular, what can we say about the points? Is it true that all points are modular or is something more complicated happening? Okay. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, right. So before, so, so now I can, I guess, I pose the question. So the question is, which points are modular? Or if you want, which open sub-varieties of the modular curve, of the elliptic curve, are modular? Okay, so what is the number of It's the cardinality of this set. Okay, this is just a finite disjoint union of this many copies. This is really not important. This is kind of a technicality, this thing. Uh, yeah, so this number is, uh, is this. And this H of O is a degree of, the, the, of this extension. Triples consisting of an elliptic curve, a subgroup of order n on the elliptic curve. So that's what's classified by the modular curve. And the extra structure I put is an, is an identification of O, okay, this given order here, with the endomorphism of the ring of the pair. And the endomorphism ring of the pair is defined to be the endomorphism of the elliptic curve which preserves the subgroup. Yes, always. When you talk about the modular problem, we always think of endomorphisms over whatever field the pair is defined over. So, so the, the, the L rational points would be such triples over L. Over the algebraic group, exactly. So it's things defined over the field L, which are isomor up to isomorphism over L bar. This first factor comes from the fact, indeed, that if, you, if n was equal to 1, then this would not be there. And you would just be classifying elliptic curves with complex multiplication by O, of which there are h of O, up to isomorphism. But then you, when, you, when you refine the moduli problem by adding the subgroup of order n, you have to ask yourself, given an elliptic curve with complex multiplication by O, how many different subgroups does it have that are preserved by the endomorphism ring? And the answer is this factor here. That's why we get these copies. It's not terribly important to me. OK. OK, so now I guess I get to the main theorem, or one of the main results I wanted to discuss in today's lecture, which is uh, really a complete answer to um, 
when are these points modular? So the point Q in E of Q is modular in this sense, in this sense, the sense that I just described, if and only if the point Q generates a rank one subgroup of the P Selma group of E, cell P E over Q, for almost all P. OK, so, we, so to understand the statement of this theorem, remember what we said about the Selma group. So we, we saw that to study the Mordel Vey group, we were led to study this Galois cohomology group consisting of the Galois cohomology of Q with values in EP. This maps to the, so this contains E of Q mod P E of Q, which is what we're really interested in understanding. But it's much bigger. So it's a set of all extensions of Galois representations some of which might arise from points, but maybe many don't. Okay, so this is much, much bigger than that. To cut down the size of the possible extensions we want to consider, we use local considerations. So we consider the H1 of QL, where QL is, are the various completions. I mean, QL is a completion of Q relative to the, to the L-adic metric. And uh, well, I mean, here, by the same connecting homomorphism of Kummer theory as here, we have an inclusion of E of QL mod P E of QL. And we can take the product over all else. So we have this kind of square. And the Selma group can, is the subset of this global cohomology whose image in the local cohomology comes from points for all L. Okay. So um, the Selmer group, cell P, P over Q, is a subgroup of this consisting, consists of the global classes that arise from points, from points in E of QL for all L, for all primes L. So it's a global extension of Galois representation which look like they come from points at least when you consider them over the various completions. So this summer group is the object which one studies the most in trying to get a handle on the Mordel Vey group, which is a lot more subtle to understand. And so this theorem says that a point is in, in the Mordel Vey group is modular precisely when it generates this summer group for all but finitely many p. Which means, in particular, since the generates a rank one, well, it generates, or generates, I mean, generates, uh, generates, I could say, I could just say generates a summer group. Uh, because if it's a single point, well, uh, if it generates, then this summer group is automatically of rank one. Never of rank more than one. So this, the, 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 this is a FP vector space whose dimension is greater or equal to the rank of the Mordel Vey group. So what this criterion tells us is that the only modular points in the definition that I gave here arise in rank one situations where the point itself in particular, if this Q generates the P sum of group for all, all but finding many P, it must also generate the Mordel Vey group uh, up to finite index. OK, so this is a very strong restriction on the points that we expect to be modular. Okay, so I'm going to explain now how this theorem, I'll give you a sketch of the ideas that go into the proof of this theorem. Sorry, what were you yeah. saying now? It's not what you were written before, right? It was, I think it was. Change the meaning of the statement. Before you wrote, Q generates a red one subgroup of Zellner. Yes. Now you have to the entire 
Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're completely right. I really mean this. You mean, you mean this? I mean this. I mean this, yes. Oh. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I meant, I meant that generates a sub and that therefore summers of rank one. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, but this turns out to be a bit uh, more useful as a criteria. And you'll see how in the proof it comes up. I mean, those two things are kind of essentially equivalent. Yeah. You see, because this imposes a strong constraint on the P summer group, which is Z mod P. And then the P to the N summer group cannot be, this kind of pretty much forces the P to the N summer group to be Z mod P to the N in this scenario. This is the right statement. What I said before was completely wrong. You're, you're right. This is what I meant. Generates a summer group. So this point can only be modular if it generates the summer group for Albert finitely many p, which implies in particular that the rank is 1. It is finite also. So as a consequence, so, uh, so I'll p. Let me, let me just continue this. So I, I, I open a parenthesis. In particular, in these cases, um, q generates a subgroup of E of Q of finite index and Sha of E over Q is finite. OK, so let's prove this. I'll have to prove this. I mean, I'll give you the main, I'll give you a very bare sketch of the ideas that go into the proof of this result. Okay, so I'm going to begin by maybe the. Yes, exactly, and that's one uh, instance where we see that the theme of modularity is, you, you know, useful for shedding light on the Bertrand Dyer conjecture. I will, and I'll explain now how that how that goes about from. No, so that's something that is, it's true. Huh? So, so uh, and Sha, you're right. So, uh, let me say, so what follows strictly is that Sha P of E over Q is trivial for all but finitely many P. Yes, and it's true that then one needs a little bit of extra work, which has been done, of course, to handle the remaining P's. Yeah. But that's not. Uh, OK, so let's, let, let, let me uh, say something about this theorem. So. I'm going to start with this implication. So if I have a modular point, how can I conclude that this modular point actually generates the Selma group for all but finitely many p, which implies all these wonderful things about the, I mean, this very strong information about the arithmetic of the elliptic curve. So if I have such a map, so if there exists a morphism from the Galois representation of x naught of n minus sigma O. So if there exists an order O with the property that this open variety over Q bar, uh, its cohomology with coefficients in QP, say, maps surjectively to the et al cohomology of the elliptic curve that I started with minus these two points, zero Q. Well, if you look at this statement, this cohomological statement, and you try to unravel it a little bit, you'll see that it, it means that what it, what it implies is that the image of these points under the modular parameterization from x naught of n to e generate a rank 1 subgroup when the Galois invariance, the, the Gal h over q invariance of, these of this group of points, generates a rank 1, I mean, a subgroup. I mean, it generates a that this point uh, Q here can be obtained 
as a linear combination of the points in here. So if this is true, then uh, it follows. Yes, then the trace. Because we have to look at the, Gal the Galois invariance of this scheme. Because the Galois group permutes the individual points over the algebraic closure simply transitively, the, the space of invariance is, is one dimensional. It's really just a trace which gives you the invariance. So then it follows that this point, uh, which I called, uh, uh, where is it? The point here, this point Q, is equal to some multiple of uh, P1 plus P2 plus PH, maybe times a, a rational number, because we're only looking at this, these Galois representations with coefficients in QP, so we've, we've introduced denominators. So maybe some multiple, some multiple of the point Q can be written in this way, where So, uh, wait, wait, sigma O, say of Q bar, is equal to P1 up to PH. Yeah, okay, here I have to say that, you see, so I wrote before that this sigma O was a union of a certain number of copies of the spec H. But, um, and you might think that from that you could gain the possibility of making more points. But there's an action of a sort of group of involutions on this modular curve that interchanges the various components and shows that in fact any component will generate, will give the same contribution to the Morel Vey group as any other component. And you don't really gain anything by working with all components at once. So here I just take a single component of this sigma O of Q bar. Okay, so I take a single uh, s component isomorphic to spec H in this uh, scheme over Q bar. Uh, uh, a single spec H in the sigma O, and then this component, I write it as a union of uh, H points, a set of H points over, over H. And so to say that this point Q arises as a trace of the points of conductor of this discriminant is equivalent to this kind of fancy statement concerning the cohomology of the open modular curve uh, uh, detecting the cohomology as open curves. That's the first thing. Exactly. So here, implicitly, uh, I want this map on the level of the op complete curves arises from the modular parameterization. So here I've used a strong geometric form of modularity to produce this map. And then I want to know whether this map from, the, from this closed, from this uh, complete curve to E can be extended, so to speak, to a map from the cohomology of the open curve to the cohomology of this open elliptic curve that respects the Galois actions and so on. And for this, uh, I just need, well, I mean, I, I need to, to know, this is just a fancy way of saying that I, I whether this point Q is generated by the traces of these points in sigma O. Right, this is a little, uh, uh, this is not hard, it's a little technical uh, thing, I don't, maybe I don't want to do it on the board now, but it's not, it's much uh, <laughs> less deep than, than the Tate conjecture. What, what do we know about the rank of the subgroup generated by the E eyes over the uh, I'll get to that a bit later. I'll say some words, actually, where I, where I finish. this is my, then my next topic, so I'll... So we have this. Um, well, now we invoke the result of coli -Wagen. So this is the key ingredient, this is the, no, the non-formal part of the argument. coli -Wagen, which tells us that if this point, which I'll call P sub, P sub O, because it depends on the, um, on the order, okay? So if P sub O is non trivial implies that the rank of E of K is equal to 1 and the Shafarevich-Tate group of E over K is finite. 
So this is the fundamental result of Kohli-Wagen, which uses these modular points, these Hagner points, to control the arithmetic of the elliptic curve. And this is something I won't have time to explain uh, the, the, at all, actually, the, the ideas that go into the proof. But this is really the, the key ingredients in this implication. Non, non, uh, non-torsion, exactly, non-trivial non-torsion. Absolutely. It's non-torsion and, so if it's non-torsion, well, this P sub O belongs to E of K a priori. But if it's non-torsion, then the rank of E of K is one, which means that this generates a finite index subgroup of E of K, and the Schaffer H J group is finite, well, then that obviously implies that uh, P sub O generates a, a, well, generates cell P, E over Q for all but finitely many primes P, right? I mean, any point which is not divisible, P sub O is divisible only by finitely many primes, and the primes that don't divide it, uh, this point will actually generate the sum of group when Sha P is trivial, which happens for all but, all but finitely many P from Kohli Wagen. So, really, the key, uh, the key uh, ingredient in this implication is uh, the work of Kohli Wagen. Now, the other implication is a uh, also quite interesting, and it uh, arises from more recent work. Um, so to handle the other implication, you need to first, so, so now what we're given is that um, in this theorem, uh, we're given the assumption that we have a point Q, and we're told that it generates the P sum of group of E over Q for all but finitely many primes P, and we want to conclude from that that this point is modular. Okay, so, uh, well, we first begin by invoking an analytic result of Valtz per J, which tells us that there exists an odd quadratic character, chi, with the property that the twist of E by chi has such that the L, uh, the L function of E twisted by this odd character chi at 1 is non-zero. So you can, this is a purely analytic, non-vanishing result for twists of L series. OK, so this odd character corresponds to a uh, imaginary quadratic field. Well, now, if we apply this result of kohli wagen again, kohli wagen or there are al alternate approaches as well due to Cato and others, that tell us that if the L function is non-vanishing, then we control the arithmetic of that curve very well. We know that it satisfies BSD. In particular, its Mordell V group is finite, and its Schaffer H J group is finite as well. So Kohli Wagen and Cato tell us that the chi, the, the Mordell V group of the twist of the elliptic curve by this character chi, and the Schaffer H J group of this elliptic curve are finite. Uh, okay. In particular, the sum of group of E over K is isomorphic to Z mod PZ for all but finitely many P, right? Because my assumption was that the sum of group of E over Q is Z mod PZ, and the, for the twist, the sum of group is trivial. It hasn't gone up, so that, that's telling me this. So I know that summer group is Z mod PZ. Now I invoke a result of skinner Bond, a very deep result. Maybe I continue the proof here on, on this small board. So what skinner Bond tells us is that uh, actually skinner Bond and also a uh, further result of Xin Wan, who was a student of Skinner, says that under this assumption, if the sum of group is E mod PZ, then that can only happen if a certain piatic L function does not vanish. So there exists, so there is a piatic L function, which I'll call L P E over K 1, such that uh, if, so that this assumption that I have on the sum of group implies that the piatic L function of E over K at 1 is non-zero. In fact, it's not divisible by P. So it's not even 0 mod P for all 
but finitely many p and for those primes p essentially for which this assumption is satisfied on the sum of but this is a very deep implication. It's kind of a converse of the of the Ricoli Wagen's result. In Ricoli Wagen, one starts from the assumption that a Hegner point is of infinite order or generates some large part of the summer group to, to then bound the Mordell Weg group and the Schaffer-Rich J group. Here, one starts from information about the, the, the summer group of E over K, the P summer group. And then deduces some analytic information about a related p-adic L function. I don't have time to say anything about what enters into the definition of this p-adic L function, but it's some, it's some object which is defined by interpolating classical special values attached to the situation. And then finally, uh, for, to conclude the arguments, from this non-vanishing, there's a result of Bertolini, Prasanna, and myself, which relates the p-adic L function in question to the logarithm of this point P sub O, this Hegner point, which came up before. And so in particular, that means that this Hegner point is non-trivial and therefore generates this rank, now by Kohli Wagen, generates this rank one subgroup, which was accounted for by the original point Q. Okay, so this is how, why these two conditions are completely equivalent. This is this p that uh, appears in the all but finitely many p. So it's any prime p outside a finite set of bad or exceptional primes. I'm, I'm lost. So this is what are these p? What, what is that? OK, so here, uh, where's my, uh, yeah, I'm also lost. Uh, so here, it's. Uh, so at this stage, I've produced an imaginary quadratic field with the property that the p sum of group of E over k is isomorphic to z mod pz for all but finitely many p. I did this by producing a twist where everything is controlled, where the summer and model of a are, are trivial. And my initial assumption was that the summer group of e over, over q was z mod pz for all but finitely many p. So now I take any of these primes p for which this conclusion is satisfied. Skinner Urban tells me that for such a p, I can produce a p-adic L function which doesn't vanish. And the idea of this proof of uh, Skinner Urban and Chin Wan is very interesting. They start with this p-adic L function, and they show that if this L function has a high order zero, then one can manufacture extension classes, and the more the higher order the zero, the more extension classes one can make in the summer group. Like this block so kind of like a p-adic variant of that. Yes. So. If the summer group was small, that meant that this piadic L function had to have a low order of vanishing. And in this context, it really means it, doesn't, it should va not vanish at all. And no, what I'm driving at is a very naive question. So in particular, those P's, those P's are maybe P's of uh, good reduction, right? Oh, yes. Uh, what is the meaning of log P? Oh, here, at the very end, uh, this concluding thing, the log P is just the formal group. It's the formal group logarithm of the point the piatic formal group logarithm. So it's just an analytic isomorphism from uh, uh, E of QP to QP. Yeah. It's just a formal group log associated with the narrow differential on the elliptic curve if you want. You're just done. It's the, it's the inverse of the block cut. Uh, yeah, I mean, exactly. Be a of, uh, this last statement is indeed a piadic analog of gross IG. You can really, you, you can notice that in this whole argument, this whole argument is very piadic, and gross IG itself does not make appear. One does not need gross IG to prove anything here, but one does need uh, this piadic variant of gross IG. So this is where, so L functions do arise in this proof, even though they do not arise at all in this statement. So one thing which is nice about this theorem is that it does not involve the piatic, the L functions, either piatic or classical, even though they play a key role in the proof. Okay, so are, are there any other questions or comments? Yeah. So in this context, what we're showing is that they, they are indeed the same. Well, sorry, I, I, I defined, given the very restricted definition I gave 
of um, what it means for a point to be modular, namely that the extension classes arises in this very special kind of open modular variety, complement of CM points in the modular curve, that any modular point arises from Hegner points. And what this work of Kohli, Wagen, and so shows, which is in a way a slightly disappointing conclusion, is that the only points that are modular are points that arise in rank one situations, which generate rank one subgroups of the model Vey group. So that modularity for, it's not true that every point is modular, at least in this sense, it's only true for points that, um, that generate uh, yeah, a finite index subgroup of the model Vey group. So this gives very, this structure, these modular points, give us very strong information about the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture for elliptic curves of analytic of rank at most one, zero or one. For that, we have essentially complete information on the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture because of these modular points. For elliptic curves of higher rank, the mystery is complete. We know absolutely no case of BSD for even a single elliptic curve of rank bigger than one. So if you want to say a little further this direction, what we have to do is to extend our number of points. And what we do here is to um, relax the notion of an easy model. So we can finish by making uh, all uh, proposals. Okay, so go to go further. What we do, we want to be less stringent. Okay, we want to relax what we need. What we need to open a bigger number. We need to find a proposal, finish one, take point, P, P is true, or can we make a few more? What can we do is to be numerical number? If this non-sensible power representation, which we have to be the alpha one of the element of the Q, arises, in the cohomology of some open more y. Right. So the point is that modular curve are the simplest example, the simplest instance, of a large class of rating varieties or Q over fields, which are corresponding to the forms of modular forms. And these varieties in the sense in these years are like known about the power organizations and like known as the power organizations connection to each more varieties and modular forms. And when I say the more varieties, they a complement of each more subvarieties in the original variety. Now then we have any, any, like this, 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 like the, the, um, the, 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 the quality of the more varieties can be very extension of the qualities of sub varieties and co-varieties and so on. And we can ask, when using classes of extension of the into a finite value of all of the more varieties, do we have more varieties than the more And this lecture, I'll focus on those very small examples, very small instances of the non-sensible power relations, asking the most of the So this is the first step, of the human model. And I hope there's a fascinating conjecture we which is that maybe even too large the situation to allow for all, so it's a relaxed notion of the modeling scale, that still, the only geometric modeling points are those that are in So that we know, the reaction will be pessimistic outlook. I think in the day you're less optimistic than the day. Oh, uh, maybe the only geometrically modular points on D are those arising in rank one situations. In fact, I'm not sure this is one. But anyway, for five seconds, I'm further not modularly. And so here I'll use a motion which is, um, uh, my idea is taking care of this. Um, so, uh, let's say a point Q, maybe Q is modular. It's not geometric, but if there exists a sequence, alpha n, of elements in A1 Q, which are found using VPD, the sequence extension classes of our organizations, which are Modular, but directly modular. Our um, probability, I want to end. The end is some power organization which depends on the interim, same as this. And the top we have, the limit that then goes to infinity of the n is equal to v, and the limit that then goes to infinity of alpha n is equal to the end of this form q under the dimension of the number of So we can plot it, and we use this. These objects, they are chaotic power organizations. And these objects are chaotic power organizations. These are big KPIs, these patterns. So we can address my form q, these are power organizations. And the chaotic limit of the interim is rising from the interim modular constructions. And it's very important. And well, so it's a real scale. So we're actually working on it. What does it tell us? Yeah, so, um, uh, it's like, right, well, it turns out that the distortion of modularity seems to be more general, and this is a little bit of a on the variety of the How are the variety of the to say, where the expected point to be modular in sense, all about the genetics, but other people can't miss the conversations, can't miss the conversations, can't miss the conversations, with the way of uh, not capturing ones, because that's what we're going to do. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, so we're saying more uh, the data right? the 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 from a model of one, so that's here. If uh, I have a row, which is an argument representation of uh, R to the two, then it corresponds to one form. In the sense that the R and L function of the row is equal to the L function of the two. But this uh, motion of the L and L is fairly instructive, 
the cattle in the national arena, not directly people watching the program, but rather by spots like the like this of uh, the same way So this is a perfect example where we said the names of the national culture, but not the imagination. And so we have to find it's worth some of the actual question, study the start class. Of the you can hope that we can now ask this will help me in the curve. I'm going to send this to the real question. I'm going to take this to the answer to Oh, so, uh, yeah, 